Well, thank you, Jan and Janelle. I, I just want to make one correction in your very nice introduction, uh, which is that I was a reporter for uh, many years for the New York Times, not the New York Post. <laughs> uh, that, that may not mean so much to people down here, but in, in New York, there's a big distinction between the two. Um, I also want to say that, that, uh, um, that Skip mentioned that um, about Elizabeth's birthday, and you might think that it's just a great coincidence that we're having that we're having the, that the pub date uh, of my book just happens to overlap with Elizabeth's birthday, but that's really not the not the not the case. Um, we deliberately wanted to commemorate Elizabeth's birthday by publishing on uh, on it um, as a fitting tribute to her, and just sort of. We just thought it would be good karma, actually. <laughs> um, we couldn't go wrong um, coming out on, her, on what for her is an important birthday. And so um, that explains the, the non-coincidence. I want to thank Skip for, I've already been here once before. As some of, some of you recidivists in the audience know, I recognize some of you already. And uh, I, want to, I want to thank Skip for having me back. Um, with when my work is further along, considerably further along than it was the last time. It's always nice to have a second, a second bite at the apple. And uh, I just looking out, I see a lot of familiar faces here, including a lot of the people that, that I interviewed. And that's also very gratifying. It's always gratifying to see a pile of books um, over there and some extra chairs that they are folding, uh, unfolding at the last minute, which is an author always likes to see. Nikolai um, sent me a, li a, a list of the people who had signed up for this afternoon's program, and on my Blackberry, I could only get the first half of them, but I looked down the list and I saw Max Brantley, Wiley Branton, um, Ralph Brody, Bay Fitzhugh, Betsy Jakeaway, and Johanna Lewis. That's only up through the L's. And these are all people who helped me and, and talked to me and, and to whom I'm grateful. And I'm sure there are a lot more of you. I see Griff Stockley. I mean, there are a lot more of you out here. And I'm, so it's a chance for me to thank all of you as well. Um, one of the questions that I'm often asked um, in interviews about this book is when I first saw the, the famous picture of Elizabeth and Hazel. And my answer is always the same. I have no idea when I first saw it. Who can say when you first saw a picture like this? This is the kind of picture that, that just seeps into your consciousness. It doesn't happen in any particular time. It's, for any sensitive person, it's the kind of picture that you grow up with. You notice it at a very early age, and it's, in, it's just engraved in your, in your mind. You never forget it once you see it. It's just one of those pictures. It's like the picture of the little boy in the, with the cap with his, with his hands up in the Warsaw Ghetto. It's one of those pictures that you see once and it sticks with you. It captures, it's a, it's a picture that, I mean, there are, many, there are many famous pictures of the civil rights movement. I mean, we all know the images of the fire hoses and the German shepherds and... and the heartbreaking images of, of, of people sitting in at lunch counters having ketchup and coffee poured on their heads or freedom riders being beaten. But this picture is different. There's something different about this picture. And what is it? What is it about this picture that stands, that stands out in our minds? I think there are a lot of things about it, but it's particularly the face. It's the face of Hazel that sets it apart. Um, I say in the book that the picture is of Elizabeth and Hazel, but the picture is really more of Hazel than it is of Elizabeth. If you look, if you look carefully at the picture, Will Counts' picture, Hazel, Elizabeth is already sort of walking out of the frame. Elizabeth is, is um, even out of focus a little bit. It's Hazel, that you, it's Hazel to, which, to whom your eyes are drawn immediately. And it's all... It, the way that it fell together, it's all just perfect staging in a way. Um, the lighting is perfect. The lighting is coming in from the side. It's early in the morning. It's bright. It sets her face apart. She's in perfect focus. She's sort of set apart from everybody else in the picture. She just stands out. 
And then there's the expression on the face. And what is, it, you know, what is that expression? It captures, I mean, what picture better captures what, was, what the, attitude, the attitude of the South towards what was going on, the attitude of the South towards desegregation in 1957, the, 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 the absolute rage, the indignation, the indignation that Southerners felt, um, the contempt, the utter contempt for black people that's captured in that picture. To use sort of a more modern uh, notion, there's also a notion that's generally applied now to modern warfare. There's the asymmetry of the picture. The fact that, the, that the, 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 the forces, the powers in the picture are so disproportionate. There's only one black face in the picture, just Elizabeth. Um, and she's surrounded by all of these white faces. And all of the power and the, 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 the force and, and, and the influence and everything is all gathered in the white community. Elizabeth is, is very much alone. Um, so Elizabeth's face, as I say, is the only black face in the picture. There were very few, at, at the point that she showed up that day, she was the first black. I say in the book that we all talk about the Little Rock Nine, at that moment, she was the Little Rock One. And it took me a while until, the picture, until I actually got a good print of the picture. Elizabeth is, is very hard to read, in a way, behind those sunglasses that she was wearing. It's kind of hard to know what, what, what she was feeling at that moment. She's described it on many occasions, but it's hard to see it. Unless you study the picture very carefully, which requires a, a good print of it, and like any good picture, you're always discovering something new every time you see it. And I noticed that, that um, if you look behind those sunglasses, you can, see, you, can see into, you can see into Elizabeth's eyes. You can see several things. You can see the sadness in her eyes. You can see the fear, of course. You can see a certain kind of resignation as if, as if she almost expected something like this to happen you can see um, heartbreak. Let's study that picture sometime and you'll see all of those things um, in her eyes. That, so, that was, so that's my answer to the, the question of when I saw the picture the first time. The second time, um, Yana Janelle just described to you, I was in, I was in Little Rock to do a story, a Clinton-related story, um, a story, truth be told, about Paula Jones if you remember her, and, and um, I guess it was sort of, I, I had sort of limited enthusiasm about doing the story to begin with, and I think it was probably my good fortune that, that she wouldn't speak with me, and so the story never happened, um, and that may be just as well, but of course, um, as an amateur student of American history, I knew all about Central High School, and I knew about the picture, and so I made a pilgrimage over to the old mobile station, which was then the visitor's center. And that was when I saw the poster of Elizabeth and Hazel. And uh, I was just amazed to see this poster. Um, I didn't know anything about the two of them ever getting together again. I guess the story was sort of a local story, and I had missed it. I hadn't read it in the, in the papers where I was. And, um, and the idea that, the, that, that these, two, these two people, these sort of archetypal antagonists had come together and there they were smiling and seemingly comfortable with one another standing in front of Central, I thought, now, now there is a story. There is a real story. So it was at that point that I started to make some phone calls um, and I don't remember honestly whether it was that visit or another visit, but I think I, I'm pretty sure that I saw the two of them very quickly. Um, the two of them were still speaking at that point, and, and I arranged to visit with the two of them. It was memorable for me because we all went out to a diner. Um, Hazel, Hazel's husband, Elizabeth and I went to this barbecue place. I think it was a barbecue place um, outside of Little Rock. And, and it wasn't Sims. Uh, I, I discovered Sims later, and I became a repeat customer, but it wasn't Sims that time. Um, and, 
It was a historic occasion because I remember that Elizabeth insisted on treating us all for lunch that day. Um, it was the first time that Elizabeth had just gotten her first credit card and she had this piece of plastic and she wasn't sure that it actually worked. <laughs> that you could actually walk out of a restaurant without actually handing over some cash. And she wanted to make sure the damn thing worked. And it did. And so Elizabeth treated us to, to lunch. Um, I didn't realize that, de at, that at that point, this was in 1999, that the two of them, that there were, that the relation, the, all of the optimism that had been generated by that, that reconciliation poster, um, the relationship had already started to fray. Um, I guess if I had been paying careful attention, I might have noticed it, but um, to me, they, they presented, uh, they, were, they were both very polite with me, and they, they seemed to be getting along and presented a united front, and, uh, and maybe I was just oblivious. I mean, I remember that I asked Hazel something about how they were getting along, and she said, well, let's just put it this way. The honeymoon is over, and now we're taking out the garbage. And I suppose that maybe that should have um, been a flag for me, but it wasn't. And, uh, but it, it quickly became apparent that, that if I were to do a book, it was not go the, the book was, the, the path to the, to the book would be a little bit rocky. And that um, it turned out that, that that day, Hazel felt that Elizabeth and I were sort of in cahoots. I mean, I had, I guess, probably the naive assumption, I think that a lot of us, particularly a lot of white people, are very naive about race. And I had just, I had just assumed that, um, you know, in, in talking to a white woman and a black woman and trying to win them over and, and, and win their confidence and, and get them to agree to talk to me for a, what was then just a magazine story, not a book, that you know, whites would sort of be natural allies and it would be the black woman who would be more skeptical and wary of me. And it was actually quite the opposite. Um, and I think that Hazel, Hazel quickly felt that Hazel had done her homework. Hazel was an interesting woman and a self-taught woman. Hazel never graduated from high school. Um, she dropped out to have a family when she was 17 years old. But she had, done, she had done her reading in the Civil Rights Movement, and she had, realized, she had learned that when the NAACP was founded, I think it was 1909, I may have that wrong, but I think it was about 1909, that there were Jews who were active in, in, in the establishment of the NAACP, and there had been this historic association between Jews and blacks. And she felt that, that, you know, that a Jewish writer and a black woman were going to be sort of naturally allies, and weren't necessarily going to be fair, that I might not necessarily be impartial in all of this. And, and so at that point, uh, um, Elizabeth leave, steps out of the picture, and for the next seven years, I never spoke to her again. She would never, she would never meet with me. And this is Hazel, if I, if I said Elizabeth. Yeah, Hazel. Um, at that point, Hazel leaves the picture, and... Um, uh, refuses to speak with me despite I, I write her letters and she's not interested in speaking with me and now I realize now that it was part of her larger sort of disillusionment with everything that had happened and so for the first seven years of my research and I had Yana uh, suggest to you before that I wasn't working full-time on this for 12 years I mean I wasn't I was gainfully employed for all that time too um, but for the first seven years I concentrated my work on Elizabeth and it started at, there's a little nice little Victorian bed and breakfast place not far from here in a pink house. Um, and Elizabeth came over and we sat in the study and got to know each other a little bit. And that's when the interview started to, that's when the interviews began. Um, and there was a lot to talk about. There, I had to learn about Elizabeth's family. I learned about the influence of her mother and particularly of her grandfather. Um, uh, her experiences at, at, in the segregated schools of Little Rock and what it was like to grow up black in Little Rock in the early 1950s. Um, we talked a lot, of course, about her year at Central 
and, and the, 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 the horrible experiences that she had there. You know, of course, there's this um, assumption that, that's grown up in recent years that a lot of this stuff is exaggerated. And I urge, if any, anybody who thinks that it's exaggerated should take the trip up to Fayetteville the way that I did. It turns out to be a very long drive. Um, well, much longer, and these states are big out here. Um, <laughs> The, the very long drive up to Fayetteville where Mrs. Huckabee's papers are. And Mrs. Huckabee was, uh, Mrs. Huckabee, the vice principal for, for girls at Central High School, was quite a pack rat and she saved all of the disciplinary cards um, that from that year, from the 1957-1958 school year and there are a lot of them. And there are a lot of them listing the various complaints that the Little Rock Nine had about People, th objects being thrown at them and being scalded in the shower and being thrown down the stairs and being, having their lockers broken into and, and being harassed in gym class and having stones thrown at them and all of that. And it's all there in contemporaneous documents in Mrs. Huckabee's files in Fayetteville. Uh, it was very useful, useful to go there. Um, so I had a long time to interview Elizabeth, and it was a it was a, um, some it was a very satisfying experience. Elizabeth is an extremely intelligent woman and sophisticated woman, with a great appreciation for history, which I admire her for enormously. Um, she understood what I was doing, and she never interfered with it. She didn't try to lobby me or propagandize me or proselytize me or spin me in any way. Um, this was true even after, I, I showed both Elizabeth and Hazel my book before it was, it was uh, cast in stone, before the publisher pushed the button. I mean, when, it was, when it, was, it was still malleable enough to change. And I remember, I even saved it, I think I still have it on my answering machine, that I, I, was, I was very curious to see what their reactions would be. And uh, one day I came back home and there was a message from Elizabeth that I listened to with some apprehensiveness. That David, this is Elizabeth, and my heart kind of dropped because I knew that she had read the book. And she said, there are, David, there are factual errors on page 16, page 32, <laughs> page 83, page 95. And she listed about eight or nine different mistakes that I had made. You know, that the street lights didn't go into her neighborhood until a certain year, or the oil didn't go on the streets before election day until such and such a time, or I had misspelled Mr. Kristoff's name at, the, at, at Dunbar, or whatever it was. These were the mistakes. Elizabeth never, you know, never tried to spin me or change my conclusions or my attitudes on anything substantive. She was just concerned that I had the facts right. And, and, uh, it just it heightened my already enormous respect for her. Um, there were many things that I was afraid to ask Elizabeth about. I mean, there were some very sensitive things about, you know, the many years that Elizabeth spent sort of in the wilderness before she went back to work um, uh, for Judge Humphrey. I, I don't know if Judge Humphrey is here, but I hope he is. Um, and uh, particularly about the, the, the death of her son, which I was really very much afraid to ask Elizabeth about. A lot of you will remember that and, and the tragic circumstances there. But I did eventually ask her about all of that. It's all in the book, and, it's, and she, she really answered, answered all of these things unflinchingly, um, just, just enormously courageous of her. Finally, after, after seven, seven or eight years of research, um, a version of my story came out in Vanity Fair, um, in, on the website of Vanity Fair. It was never actually in the magazine. And so then something quite miraculous happened. Um, uh, Hazel read the article, and at that point she could see that I had no animus towards her, that I wasn't yet another, another Yankee do-gooder, um, second-guesser coming down here to take pot shots at her, 
that I was trying, even though she wasn't speaking with me, I had tried to understand her as best I could and that I didn't have it in for her. And so at that point, and also I think she was heartened by some of the things that Elizabeth had said about her. They hadn't spoken to one another at this point for several years. In fact, I, as I point out in the book, the last time that they spoke was on September 11th, the September 11th um, of 2001 when Hazel was in Massachusetts and got scared by what was going on and even though they were no longer talking to one another, who did Hazel call? She called Elizabeth for sort of support and sustenance which says something about the kind of relationship that they had formed even though they were incommunicado at that point. So at that point I started to talk to Hazel and to make up for lost time and I felt very lucky about that because the book got a certain kind of symmetry. I didn't want it, I wanted to, the book to be Elizabeth and Hazel. I didn't want it to be just Elizabeth. And so I caught up with Hazel and she soon learned, I soon subjected her to the same incessant kind of questioning that I, I had or, to which I'd already subjected Elizabeth. Elizabeth was always amazed that I kept having more questions for her and whenever I said to her, you know, this may be it. I think I may not have any quite more, more for you. She would she'd laugh. She, she came to laugh at a certain point because she knew that there'd always be more. Um, and so then Hazel got um, subjected to the same treatment um, as Elizabeth. And I learned her story going back to Redfield. She took me to Redfield where she grew up, to Biddle Shop. Do I have that right? Biddle Shop, the neighborhood in Little Rock um, where she lived when she first moved here. Um, I, learned, I, I learned about her background, her sort of racial attitudes, a little bit about the, uh, about the day of the picture and how, in a way, how typical the picture was of somebody of her background, you know, uh, reflecting the racial attitudes that she had grown up with, but also, in a sense, atypical an important sense atypical because she was really quite an apolitical girl. She really didn't care about politics. She didn't think much about politics. She was into boys and dancing, um, which was why she was sort of dressed the way she was that day. I mean, Steve's show mattered much more to her than Brown versus Board of Education. <laughs> that was very clear, and she'd, be the, and she'd be the first to admit that. And so there was a lot, of, you know, a lot of acting out that day. I mean, she just, you know, she was somebody who was kind of a performer and she wanted to outperform the other girls that day. And that's what she did. And, that's, and, and that was the moment that Will Counts happened to capture in his picture. She was just sort of acting out. And she was also um, 15 years old. And uh, I, think that, I think that's an important factor. She looks much older than that in that picture, and I think that people judge her as somebody much older than that, rather than as some 15-year-old girl who was just out to sort of impress her friends. Um, so I followed, I followed Hazel's story up through that very dramatic moment that we mentioned before in 1962 or 1963, it's even significant that, that Hazel didn't remember precisely when it happened, but she'd seen these disturbing images on television. She was living in a trailer outside of Little Rock. She had two young kids, and she was seeing these images of the civil rights movement and these images of brutality, and she realized that she had, she had made her own unique contribution to that, and that I think it dawned on her slowly that her own children were going to grow up to, to realize that that was their mother in this picture, in their history book, and that she had an account to settle. And so she picked up the phone one day. This is one of those Rashomon things where people have different memories of the same thing. It's unclear whether she reached Elizabeth directly or whether Elizabeth's grandfather answered the phone and took a message, but one way or the other, at some point, Elizabeth and Hazel actually spoke. And Elizabeth and, and Hazel said, say, uh, said to Elizabeth, I'm the girl in the picture, um, and I just want you to know how sorry I am for what I did. And there's really not that much more to say about the conversation. It was a very short conversation. Um, uh, I think that, that there really wasn't that much more for either of them to say, and that, and that was it. 
But it was, uh, to me, an enormously significant moment in the story because, you know, every, every author wants to like, it's easier to like the people that you're writing about um, for whatever reason. You want to you like them and you want to trust them. And, and I thought this was, it, it was very significant that um, in 1962, you know, when there was no Oprah on television and there were no television cameras around and nobody was watching and nobody was recording it and not every, you know, not every moment was considered fodder for tabloid television. You know, in the privacy of a trailer in the outskirts of Little Rock, um, Hazel made that phone call. And so that, that, to me, put into a different light everything that Hazel did subsequently. Um, it said to me that her heart was in the right place. So we fast forward. I mean, I don't fast forward. I don't do anything fast uh, <laughs> when I'm writing, but um, we fast forward now. I mean, in the book, I, d I describe, you know, Elizabeth goes into the army. Elizabeth gets out of the army. Elizabeth tries to find herself. Elizabeth has many years sort of in the wilderness. Elizabeth has two children. Um, Hazel raises her family. She has three kids and she quickly has grandchildren and, and, and gets involved with a number of, a number of sort of hobbies, she, belly dancing and new age, various new age kinds of things, but also tries to get involved with the black community um, in certain ways. Um, she starts working with unwed mothers and mothers with children in foster care. Um, she goes on, she works with underprivileged kids and takes them on field trips. Again, the only cameras that are there are, you know, are point and shoots that people happen to bring with them. There's no press coverage of any of this. Her husband sort of makes fun of her for, you know, for trying to, still trying to atone for the picture. But this is, this is how she wants to live her life and she wants to be a role model for her children. Um, and she's bothered by the fact that the picture keeps appearing with, with increasing frequency. Every anniversary the picture appears and it's in all the history books and the fifth anniversary and the tenth anniversary and all of that. And no one ever bothers finding out whatever happened to her. And you know, she thinks that she knows that she's evolved but, but no one else knows that. And she's not press savvy so it doesn't occur to her to call anybody up and plant the story anywhere. And it really takes the fortieth anniversary to sort of bring out her story. And I would imagine that many people here remember the 40th anniversary and how she comes forward and how Will Counts, the original photographer, comes back to town and takes the, and takes the second picture that becomes the poster um, that sort of gets all of Little Rock's hopes up that Skip Rutherford um, decides to put on a poster uh, and uh, that's sold in the visitor's center, still being sold in the visitor's center, apparently. Um, people still want to believe the message of the poster. It says reconciliation at the bottom of it. Um, and everybody remembers um, how excited everyone was, and the idea was that if these two people could make up, well, then perhaps Little Rock, which had, which had lived in shame for all of these years and, you know, was an embarrassment and to its citizens and, and, and uh, laughing stock around the world. Maybe Little Rock had finally turned the corner and there was great hope placed in the relationship between Elizabeth and Hazel and their, their ostensible reconciliation. And, you know, on the one hand, of course, we know in retrospect that, that this was naive to expect that, that two people could bridge a gap so significant. But on the other hand, it was prophetic. I mean, what, what I describe in the book is a story that's really quite extraordinary about how the two of them developed a relationship with one another, again, when, when people weren't looking. And, and they, they, they made presentations together. They spoke to, to, to school, high schools and, and college kids and, and, and uh, grade school kids together. Um, they became sort of a, a road show and talked about their respective experiences. That, was, that part of it was all public, but they also started to hang out p privately too. They went on field trips together, they'd go to flower shows together, they'd go to thrift shops together, they'd buy books together, they'd go to hot springs together, um, and they actually discovered that they had a lot in common. And, and 
became, I think, um, they became friends and to quite an extraordinary degree. And I, meant, and I mentioned that, you know, any motorist in Little Rock who had happened to pass them in a car and saw this white woman and black woman sitting in the car next to them at the intersection, the white woman driving because Elizabeth never got her license, um, and so Hazel was always the driver, to think that those were the two women who were in the famous picture, and here they were just driving around together. Whoever would have, whoever would have come to that realization would have driven off the road. Um, so, there was, so there was this bond, um, but as I say, by the time I came along in 1999, it was already starting to fray. And I, descri I, I describe this in the book. I describe the causes of it. I think that, you know, from Elizabeth's standpoint, as I say, Elizabeth is a student of history. Elizabeth is very demanding. It's demanding of herself and demanding of other people and, and very precise. She speaks precisely. She, she de demands precision from other people. And, and she thought that Hazel, she, she couldn't believe that that, the, that some of the things that Hazel couldn't explain were, were sort of unconscious errors of omission. She thought that it had to have been deliberate. She was, I mean, I'd be the first to say, and maybe Elizabeth would agree, Elizabeth was tough on Hazel and, and demanding on Hazel. And she couldn't believe, for instance, that a photograph, a scene that horrible, could have been under something as horrible as what happened on September 4th of 57, could have been undertaken so lightly. There had to have been more of a story to it. Hazel had to have remembered more about it than she did. And the fact that she didn't remember more about it and that she was as casual about it as, as she was had to have been a conscious attempt at dissembling. It had to be deceitful. It couldn't just be forgetfulness or inattentiveness. And there were many things like this that, that Elizabeth took issue with in Hazel's story. And that was, that was one thing that was happening. From Hazel's standpoint, I mean, Hazel felt this kind of tension coming from Elizabeth. Hazel also felt a kind of antagonism coming from other members of the black community and other members of the Little Rock Nine who seemed to resent her presence at various events, who thought that she was out to cash in. Where had she been all these years? You know, she was clearly out to make a buck. She couldn't possibly be sincere. And of course, Hazel knew better than that, and Hazel knew that all of these years she had been working, to, working for racial amelioration, um, but she couldn't convince other people, she couldn't convince other people of that. And then there was the flack that she took in the white community. Um, she took a lot of that. For all the approbation that she got, there were a lot of people who felt that Hazel was a great embarrassment to the white community, that she had become the symbol of white Little Rock, that all of the good kids at Central High School had been tarred by her brush, and that you know, the world had come to think that everybody at Central High School was like Hazel that year. In fact, Hazel had, hadn't even been in Central that year. Her parents pulled her out within a week of the time the picture was taken, and she wasn't even a student at Central that year. And there's a story in the book about Hazel going to a, one of her class reunions. I, it's absolutely striking to me that, that somebody in Hazel's position would have the nerve and the guts in a way to go to a class reunion, but she did go, and everybody sort of ignored her and, and, or sort of snickered at her. She heard people snickering, you know, that's the girl in the picture. And she, re and she told me that one of the girls in the picture, one of the girls who was snickering at her, was one of the same kids who had jumped out the second floor window at, at Central the day the black kids actually arrived. Um, so Hazel felt she didn't need this. You know, she didn't need this um, kind of um, disapproval. And she started to withdraw and uh, has continued to withdraw ever since. And so, you know, among, I, among all of the people I talked to for this book, um, and as I say, I see a lot of you in the audience, Hazel is not here today. Um, Hazel, hasn't, Hazel said that, that um, she hoped that, she expected that the interviews that she gave to me would be the last that she would ever give. Um, in publicizing my book, Hazel will not go on television. Um, Hazel has... Um, Hazel is out of town. I spoke to her the other day, and she's 
out of town. You know, it, it's probably um, a pre-planned vacation, but it's also a little bit convenient. Um, and I don't say that disparagingly, but this is, you know, she doesn't want to be around for any of this. And uh, they even got, they even, I, I left out that they even got flack from Oprah Winfrey. Um, Oprah, the two of them went on Oprah Winfrey together. And Oprah seemed to resent the, their, their reconciliation or their relationship. And Oprah was very skeptical and very peremptory and harsh and quick with both of them. And sort of, there was an episode of Oprah where she was discussing the most important photographs of the 20th century. And of course, the picture of Elizabeth and Hazel was among them. But she got them on and off the, the program very, very quickly. Um, and uh, even though Elizabeth and Hazel were sort of um, coming apart at that point and their, re their relationship was growing more distant, they could both agree that they had been ill-treated that day and uh, felt very bad about it afterward. I always lose track of time. I hope that I'm reasonably on time here. Um, so the... I think that, so there, as I say, their last conversation was on September 11th of 2001, and they've, they've not spoken since. Um, I, in, in looking around, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how Little Rock has treated me um, in, in, in working on this book. Um, I have to say that, that I was, was self-conscious about, about coming down here. In the course of doing my work, um, I was very conscious of, as I say, of placing myself in a position to judge in the, in the convenience of the 21st century of judging people. It's very easy to take pot shots at people from different eras and not, not, to, have, um, not to have been here at the time and not, not to have known how I would have behaved. There was a quote that I came across. I'm not going to read anything from my book tonight, but I just want to read one quote that I came across in the course of my research that, that uh, I thought um, captured my attitude towards my work so beautifully that it's the epigraph in the book. It's from Frederick Douglass who says, my interest in any man is objectively in his manhood and subjectively in my own manhood. And that's the way that I feel about this project, that you know, this was really it was really a chance for me to try to assess what I, where I would have been and what I would have done in 1957 if I had been here. You know, a white guy, a, a student at Central High School or a citizen in Little Rock or whatever, and how I would have, whether I would have stood up and how well I would have stood up. And that's, you know, that's the attitude that I, with which I tried to write all of this. I tried to let the facts speak for themselves. Um, I tried not to be any more judgmental than I, than, than I needed to be and uh, not to take the easy shots. A lot of people in Little Rock, most people in Little Rock were very nice to me. I got help from all kinds of people at various research libraries. I placed ads in, in, in uh, the Little Rock paper for people's recollections. Um, I had many, many interesting experiences some very moving experiences and some surprising experiences. I mean, history is always more complicated and the complications and surprises of history are, are what make it so enriching and satisfying to do. I mean, I, remem I remember um, in particular in, in response to one ad that I placed in the, in, the, uh, in the Democrat and Gazette for people who remembered the picture. I wanted to find the people who were in the picture and I wanted to find people um, who were at Central with Elizabeth, and I wanted to retrieve as many stories as I could. And I, re and I remember, I thought that was somebody heckling before over there, but I, th <laughs> I don't think it is. Um, uh, I remember one woman calling me. I didn't, get, I didn't get many responses to these ads, but I remember that there was one woman who called me, and she, and she said that, you know, my father was a segregationist, a white woman calling me. My father was a segregationist, and uh, um, but he came home that he was he came home the night that that picture of Elizabeth ran. It ran in the 
I hope I get this right. It ran in the Democrat before it ran in the Gazette because the Democrat was the evening paper, and so it ran. Will Counts's picture ran first, and there was a very similar picture taken by a fellow named Johnny Jenkins that ran in the, in the Gazette the next morning. Um, Hazel, incidentally, was not identified in either picture, which is interesting. Um, one of the editors, I talked to many of the newspaper people who were covering the story, and one of the editors said that things were so inflamed that, we, that there was no need to, no, no sense in identifying her, and besides, to us, she was just a generic white girl, a generic segregationist girl, and there was no need to identify her. Um, but anyway, um, this person contacted me after, I, after the ad ran, and she said, my, my father came home that night, and we were sitting around the dinner table, and, I, and I'll always remember him saying, I don't want my kids going to school with niggers either, but they didn't treat that little black girl right. And I thought that was so moving um, that, he, that that was what he said and that she remembered it after all these years, that that picture, that picture scandalized, it embarrassed even segregationists, that picture. Um, my only, the only fault that I would find, um, as I say, Hazel would tell you that, that apologizing, that coming forward was a mistake. To her, it was, it was a bad mistake in, uh, that she made. Um, it was ill-advised. She says that she's sorry that she did it. And that, that all, of these, all of these people on those pink slips in Mrs. Huckabee's file in, in Fayetteville, none of them ever came forward, or very few of them ever did. Um, they went on to live their lives. Nobody ever gave them any grief. Um, I tried to call a few of them, and uh, didn't, I didn't get very far with most of them. I remember calling up one person in particular whose name was all over the files. Um, um, I think probably a name that many of you would recognize, somebody in a position of some prominence in town, and he hung up on me. He wouldn't talk to me about it. I mean, that was one way to do it, was, which was to pretend that nothing happened. Um, and so while I'm not judgmental about a lot of people, I am judgmental about the people who really ran amok that year and were allowed to run amok by the school authorities and really uh, paid very little price for it and in later years never did come forward. And I think also that there's this, there's this dangerous trend um, to pretend that, that things were not all that bad and that, you know, that things have been exaggerated and that the Little Rock Nine has sort of created a cottage industry of sympathy and that uh, um, enough already with this and let's just move on and it's all exaggerated. And I would urge people to not just to read my book, which is, at, which, which, you know, is after all secondary history, you know, just go back and read some of the contemporaneous documents. Go back into, into Mrs. Huckabee's files and, and read those reports. She had no ax to grind. She was just recording what was happening. Um, and so I think that that kind of revisionism, which surfaced on the 50th anniversary, there was a story in the Democrat Gazette about, in which many of the people who were at Central um, in 1957 and 58 were saying that it was really just only a few bad kids and, and things, had, things had not really been that bad. Um, that needs, we have, to, we have to guard against that. And I think that no one has been more vigilant about guarding against that than Elizabeth. Um, one, of the, one of the remarkable um, moments in the story is Elizabeth, um, Elizabeth, a woman who once used to have to bring a, a wastebasket lined with a plastic bag um, with her when she spoke in public for fear that she'd get sick while she was speaking. She was that scared of public speaking. Um, Elizabeth having become uh, adept and passionate and articulate and confident enough to give a speech was the one who was chosen to give a speech at the commemoration of the Visitor's Center the day after that article ran in the paper. And, you know, she as an eyewitness to all of this was, no one was, no one was better suited to, to counter the argu this revisionist argument that things weren't, things were, things were not really all that bad. And she gave a, she gave a very impassioned speech about that that was, 
that was very moving. So this story has a very happy ending for me. I mean, I, I, feel, I feel very proud of this book. Um, I feel privileged to have met both Elizabeth and Hazel, and as, as I said, um, I admire them both, and that's a great, a great treat for an author. I met a lot of interesting people uh, doing this book. I've made probably 10 visits to Little Rock, and I've enjoyed my trips down here, even when the town was snowbound and completely paralyzed with maybe a half an inch of snow. <laughs> and, I, and I learned that Little Rock apparently has no snow trucks, and, and I, was grateful for, I was grateful that there was food in my hotel because there was nowhere to eat and everything was closed. Um, but the town was nice to me, and most of the people I interviewed were gracious and gracious, and patient with me, and, and I think that, I hope that they feel that, that uh, my book is, is, a, is, is fair. That's the most important thing. So it's a happy ending for me. Um, as, you know, as, as, um, as it stands, it's not a happy ending for Elizabeth and Hazel. I tried not to sugarcoat it. Um, I tried not to influence it in any way. I didn't think that it was my role to try to bring them together. And, uh, you know, when I would come down here, I would visit them separately. I would rarely talk to one about the other until the very end. I mean, a reporter always puts off the hard questions until the end. But at a certain point, I would have to say, you know, Elizabeth, Hazel says such and so about you. Is this true? Hazel, Elizabeth said such and so about you. And just crisscross and go back and review what one of them had said about the other. But one thing struck me, and I don't know whether Elizabeth would agree with this or not, but I, I was struck by how each of them talk, when each of them, when they talk about one another, they each get choked up. I mean, it's very clear to me, and maybe I'm just, you know, the outsider and the armchair psychologist, but it's very clear to me that there's still a very strong bond that exists between these two women and a very profound connection between them. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my place, as I say, to bring them together. I asked only at the very end, when my, at the behest of my photographer. My photographer said, you know, we have to try to get a picture of them together. They owe it to history to pose one more time together. And I actually had reluctantly did ask them both. And I don't know if you could, if you could predict what their reactions would have been. Um, I was, for all the years I put into it, my reaction, I think, was a little bit naive still. But Elizabeth was willing, uh, because as I say, Elizabeth is a student of history, and Elizabeth realized that for better or for worse, these two people in perpetuity are going to be joined together, and they, and they had a certain obligation for the sake of history to let history see them as they turn 70. I hope I'm not giving away some secret there, Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> And, and, and so Elizabeth was game to do it. She said, I'm, she said, I'm not sure what I would say to her, but I, but I would do it. And, and Hazel said, Hazel didn't say no. Hazel said, I'm not ready yet. And the operative word there is yet. And I, I'm hopeful that, you know, sometime when we're all out of the way and, and there, nobody is looking and nobody's paying any attention to them, that... Um, the two of them do come back together again in some way. Um, and um, that would indeed be a very happy ending. So I, I just want to thank all of you for coming and, and for caring about this story and for caring about my book. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. All right. Thank you, David. All right, uh, we have time for some questions, so uh, please raise your hands. Uh, Ms. Abrams. Now, why am I not surprised that you're asking the first question? <laughs> you got to know me very well. I did, and you were very, you were extremely helpful. And I don't know, I must have seen you on that list because I got the A's on that list, and you must have been on there. No, I'm not on it. Oh, you weren't on that's there. Not, oh, okay. Not All right, so that's why I didn't she see it. She just shows up. She, she doesn't shows RSVP. Up, yeah. She has a permanent she has senior. A, David, <clears throat> I am a scholar of history, and I have great respect for you as a researcher of history. 
but most historians also are prophets. My question to you is, in light of the history that you did for not only Little Rock, but for this country, and at the time that we are now as a prophet of research and the divisiveness that is now present as we have an African-American president, what is your projection of how far we have come in this country, not just in Little Rock? Well, the first, my first comment is that, the, that the, the words history and prophet, at least when prophet is spelled with an F, P-R-O-F, are rarely, are, are, are rarely associated with one another. And, and pro probably prophet with a P-H, not much more. Um, I think that, I think that um, this story has hopeful and both pessimistic and hopeful elements to it. You know, just extrapolating from, from, extrapolating from this story. And as I say, I think that on the one hand, you could read this with great despair, you know, that, that um, two people of, of good faith um, had the experience and, uh, that they had. Um, on the other hand, um, as I say, there's this very, I think that there's this very profound connection between the two of them and let's face it, I mean, when you, when you read, there, there was just an amazing collection of material that I, that I came across. I don't want to take up too much time. I want to give people a chance to ask questions, but there, I just want to take one slight digression that, to say that, that um, there was an MIT professor who came down here in 1957 to research what was going on in Little Rock. And, and I went to look at his papers in, at, at MIT. He died several years ago. And he, his papers were absolutely voluminous, um, 40 boxes of them. And there was everything in there but his stuff on Little Rock, which was heartbreaking. Um, and so I, it, it turned out that I knew his, his, well, his son-in-law was a former New York Times reporter and, and I, whom, I, whom I knew. And um, he said, let's, let's, we'll look around. I spoke, to, I spoke to his son, and his son said, you know, there's one more box of his stuff in the back of my closet. Let me just look in there. And sure enough, the Little Rock file was in there. And he spent several days down here interviewing um, the leading citizens of Little Rock, going to, is it the Arkansas Club, the, se the segregated club? The Little Rock Club, the Little Rock Club. No Jews or blacks allowed. Um, and uh, he, he was, he, this researcher was allowed in there because he was a guest of the people, but he could never have joined as a Jew. And, you know, the, the world that these people describe, I say in the book that it's something like, I mean, all of these people are, are now dead. And it's like Spoon River Anthology, for those of you who remember, their voices from the dead talking about Little Rock in 1957. And it was really a pretty bleak place and, you know, racially it was, it, it was in the Neanderthal age. And, 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 you know, you don't have to be Pollyanna to know about the strides that have been made since then and how, you know, even an event like this would have been unthinkable back then. You know, I mean, you fly into Little Rock, I always think, I mean, these are superficial things maybe, but the first thing you see when you fly into Little Rock is the Little Rock Airport Commission the photographs of those five or six people, you know, and there are, I think there are two blacks and four whites or whatever, or maybe it's three and three, I don't even know. And you're reminded right off the bat of how much different things are here, um, at least on the surface. And so, I mean, I think all of the, you know, so much of the antagonism toward Obama is racially, is racially oriented and, and there remain very, very deep divisions in this country and real misunderstandings and real animosity, and there's a, there's a hell of a lot of work still to do. And maybe I should, and, and I almost feel guilty tacking on, but look how far we've come, because that's the usual Pollyanna-ish addendum. But there is some truth to that, too. Yeah, got a question. Elizabeth. Yeah. Books like David or any historical book, um, bring elements of truth because people in 
where things have happened, say that something happened here. I don't know much about it, but something happened here. That's childish. But it happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. And it's certain, that is what made me start talking about those painful memories. And that type of thing does continue. It happens everywhere. But some people go to the primary sources. <laughs> and there is a primary source. I think, I, I, uh, I, I think you should take that as a compliment. Well, sir. well, she is there. She is she is the primary source, right. and so is Minnie Jean. I, is Minnie Jean here? Yeah, Phyllis is. Spirit is. Yeah, yeah. Well, Minnie okay. Jean well, speaking Min, well, Minnie Jean. Minnie. Oh, okay. Because I, you know, I've I, I've often said that my the one biggest mistake that I made in doing this book is not writing concurrently about Minnie Jean, and doing a boxed set. <laughs> you know, because she does. You know, she. There couldn't be two people more different than Elizabeth Eckford and Minnie, and Minnie Jean Brown Tricky. Uh, they're, they're complete opposites, polar opposites, only, only united in how amazing each of them is. And, and it was a missed opportunity, and I hope that somebody else does her book. Ruth, you got a question right here. It's really more of a compliment. I had the pleasure to read this book this past month. and. Um, I, I urge, if you don't have a copy, don't leave without it. And, and a couple of things I want to say. Um, Dave describes the dresses that the two girls wore that day. And I was so, I, I could identify with both of them because I had both of those dresses. So, so that's the kind of care that he took in telling the story because he made, it, he made them very uh, easy to, to, to identify with. And the other thing I want to say is that um, more often than not, folks who come from out of town and try to write this story are not, they often make all of the white people villains and all of the black people heroes. And instead, you gave us two beautifully um, complex human beings, and I really, really appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to you for saying that. I, I thank you for mentioning the dresses, because I think, I think that the, 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 story, the story about Elizabeth and her sister Anna making her skirt uh, for school um, is, is just is so powerful to me. And the fact that Elizabeth never wore that skirt again, you know, this skirt that was made with such hope for the first day of school, and that, you know, that she put it up in the attic and it disintegrated and at some point it was thrown away. Annie Abrams had the right, well, had the, first of all, had the right idea that that was a dress that should have ended up in the Smithsonian. Uh, it should, that's, where, that's where it belonged, and instead it disintegrated, and I'm glad that, I'm glad that you noticed that. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, Ralph Brody is here. Ralph came to my last talk. Um, Ralph and I have different feelings about parts of my story, but I have great respect for him. And I tried to be fair to him, and, and uh, I tried to, as I say, I tried, to, I tried to put myself in the shoes of anybody who was here then, and, and not, just, not just throw around these very easy generalizations about people. This was a, it was a, a complicated situation that was thrust upon Little Rock, and you know, I tried to capture it in, in as much of its complexity as I could. Yes, he forgot a question right there at the back. Hi, my name is Heath Carlock. I'm a second year Clinton School student. Um, I actually was with Mrs. Eckford on the 50th, um, well, when they had the Congressional Gold Medal um, ceremony earlier this year. Uh, I was the person responsible to be alongside her for that whole function, so several hours. So that was um, an insider's take, and thank you so kindly for being so wonderful. Um, my question to you is this. Our latest stanza of our national race drama ends at a ranch in Texas where there is a rock. Um, on that rock was something derogatory 
and inflammatory. How would you go about advising today's youth in understanding the history associated with that when so many are disconnected from that particular history and the word associated with that rock? Well, I think, you know, first of all, I'm hopeful, and not just for my own selfish reasons, that people read a book like this. I mean, this is, everybody is in high school at one time or another. And I think that, you know, this book sort of frames the issue from the standpoint of two high school kids living through all of these issues. And I think that, you know, it, it's sort of, for people who don't know much about this era or these issues, it's a, it's a good initiation into them. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that this has to be addressed with great candor. And I mean, I mean you absolutely no disrespect. That rock said nigger head on it. I mean, people won't say it because they think that it's better not to say the word. But the full outrageousness of that episode can be captured only if you, if you don't euphemize it or fuzz it over, you know, or just obscure it. It needs to be articulated, you know. It's, and I, didn't, I didn't hesitate. If that word came up in the course of my book, I used it because that was part of the language of 1957. Now, the Perry story illustrates that it's part of the language of 2012. I mean, it was, we know, or 2011, it was painted over and apparently it disappeared at some point. But beneath, this, beneath the surface of the history of this country, there are a million episodes like this. It's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. And, and uh, you know, we do ourselves no favor not to acknowledge it. And it's sort of, I, I'm, I'm kind of pleased whenever, you know, when Haley Barber says something or when an episode like this happens or, you know, we can each think of many other in instances where race sort of peaks, its, peaks up its ugly head. Um, uh, it needs to be discussed. It needs to be ventilated. It hasn't gone away, and it's deeply embedded. And so I think it's a, I think it's a good thing, and it's instructive when it happens. And, and even when we discuss it, as you and I are discussing it now, it needs to be, it needs to be discussed explicitly. Ladies and gentlemen. On Elizabeth Eckford's 70th birthday, on the first day of publication, you have a chance to get an autographed copy of Elizabeth and Hazel. David, thank you very, very much. Thank you all.